in this particular episode i propose to discuss with you a very interesting topic the nature of state in the third world now why i call this topic interesting is because it is countries in the third world which are uh, almost alleged to have um, such terms associated with their states as hybrid states or failed states or collapsed states etc now before i move into examining any of these allegations i would first like to draw your attention to the fact that state or a normal state as it is called nowadays is the basic unit of political analysis and by the word state i refer to that political organization or institution which mandatorily has to have four basic characteristics uh, well this is all very elementary in the sense that uh, we probably uh, those of us who have studied political science uh, at the plus 2 level we are all aware of these four characteristics none of the le- nonetheless i would like to draw your attention to those four features firstly a state is supposed to have a definite area of land with a definite uh, boundary a well defined boundary or a territory the second feature that a state should have is an adequate amount of population right neither too uh, many people nor too less a moderate or an adequate amount of population the third characteristic feature of a state is that in order to manage and process uh, the different demands uh, you know of of the people present in that state as well as to act as a uh, mechanism of conflict resolution if i go by the liberal tradition uh, a government was required okay a government which would uh, perform the basic functions of law making policy making uh, and execution of laws and policies as well as dispensation of justice now lastly and very very significantly this government was also required to have another quality without which a particular territorial area could not be called a state in the academic jargon of political science that quality happens to be sovereignty sovereignty as in the ultimate power of the state sovereignty as in uh, the ultimate power to use coercion the ultimate power to use legitimate force or coercion as possessed by the government of a particular society uh, you know to uh, do to take away rather uh, the most basic or the most fundamental rights of its citizens when grounds are justified for doing so thus territory population government sovereignty happen to be the most essential or basic characteristics of this particular political institution state which is the basic unit of political analysis now when i think about or when i start talking about or discussing about state in the perspective of the third world countries um i enter into a field which is not very easy or very concrete to tread upon because these are all states which have been formed very recently in human history these are all states which have had a common past experience of colonial and imperial domination plus exploitation these are also states which have mostly found it very very difficult to create and maintain democratic stable political regimes these are also states where uh, there has been a recurrence of economic debt uh, and these are also mostly those states of the world uh, which are uh, generally speaking the so called backward states in the world now it is indeed interesting that not one or two but so many countries of the world almost 3/4 of the total number of countries or states that exist uh, at present should be categorized as developing countries or the third world countries 
Now, these are countries which are experiencing all these common problems that I have just uh, explained or highlighted. Now, the question therefore arises uh, as to whether we can really define in any uh, common uh, uh, usage the nature of states that operate in these third world countries. Now, if I examine a, a particular uh, terminology which is used very often these days uh, to refer to third world countries, it would I would begin with uh, the term hybrid state or mixed state. By the term hybrid state or mixed state, we are talking about countries of Latin America, of West Africa, uh, such states which seem to have frozen between an authoritarian regime and a democratic regime. We must not confuse uh, ourselves with the understanding that these states, you know, were moving from an autocratic regime to a democratic regime and they have frozen somewhere in transition. No, these are not transitional states. These are states which have deliberately acquired and maintained certain elements of both autocratic forms of government as well as of uh, democratic form of government. For instance, uh, they might have, uh, you know, elections for uh, the particular uh, highest executive office of the country. These elections may be conducted on the basis of universal adult suffrage, but at the same time, whichever the executive is, uh, mostly, let's say, a presidential form of government, the president, once elected, turns almost autocratic uh, while running the government. For instance, uh, the range and the intensity of the civil, political, social, cultural rights that are enjoyed by the citizens of these hybrid states are very limited when you compare uh, these liberties or rights with those enjoyed by citizens living in first world countries or belonging to first world countries. Right? So we see that uh, basic features or characteristics of autocratic as well as democratic states persist and coexist sort of as far as these hybrid states are concerned. Now L. Diamond, uh, he says that uh, when he writes an article uh, called Thinking About Hybrid States in 2002, he says that uh, uh, these third world countries, some of these third world countries fall in what he calls the gray zone of uh, political system classification. They can neither be termed as completely democratic nor be looked upon as completely autocratic. The other term which is used to refer to these states of the third world is failed states. Now, once again, this term is also a little controversial and definitely not a term which is, uh, you know, universally acknowledged or accepted amongst uh, scholars across the globe. But nonetheless, uh, failed states uh, recently, various factors have been identified uh, to find out and to categorize as to whether a state can be called a failed state or not. And it was found that many of the countries which fall in the list of third world countries have uh, had certain uh, indicators within themselves which qualify them as failed states. Now, what exactly do I mean by a failed state? States which have lost the exercise of their sovereign power due to many reasons. For instance, Yugoslavia, Lebanon, Liberia, we find that it is uh, the escalation of communal tensions which has uh, led to a severe challenge and blow to the sovereign uh, exercise of sovereignty by the governments of these particular states. Uh, whereas in countries like Nicaragua, Philippines, Iran, we find that it is uh, the level of state corruption and bureaucratic corruption which has led to the siphoning away of resources available in the, these countries to such an extent that the people of these countries or actually the citizens of these countries are not benefiting from the exercise of these resources, right? Another uh, reason or index which has been identified is uh, that of guerrilla warfare activities, okay, or regional guerrilla warfare activities which have been very high in countries like Colombia or Vietnam. 
which once again had challenged the supremacy, the exercise of sovereign authority by the states present in these particular societies. Another very important reason or index uh, that is identified as a cause of uh, failed states is, you know, the collapse of democracy due to a civil war or a military coup breaking out in major parts of the country. For instance, in Nigeria, Madagascar, this is exactly what happened uh, to lead to a collapse of state sovereignty. The last and the final index, which uh, is used generally to classify states as fa failed states, is uh, the reform crisis in an authoritarian state. That is, a state which was previously authoritarian in nature may have assumed a democratic political structure uh, in the post-colonized uh, world, or rather in the decolonized world, uh, but the kind of reforms that have been brought about have not been adequate to meet with all the challenges that these third world societies are facing since their birth, right? Now, uh, as I said at the beginning of my discussion, that these terminology like hybrid states or failed states aren't exactly universally acceptable by all schools of thought who are dealing with the topic of the nature of state in the third world. Now, it therefore becomes uh, very uh, difficult for us to make any comprehensive understanding of the nature of the state in the third world possible. There have been suggestions. There have been suggestions of usage of alternative terms. For instance, some scholars have suggested that we can refer to states as, you know, collapsed states or fragile states or war-torn states. Uh, because it matters at the end of the day as to where exactly my state stands uh, when I am looking at it uh, in a ranking of all the states present in the world today. Right? But without further ado, I think that in order to understand the true nature of the state in the third world, we can perhaps turn to Lucien Pai. Lucien Pai uh, was one of the pioneers in the 1950s and 60s uh, when the development theories uh, started becoming popular, uh, especially in the context of the third world countries. Now, uh, Pai suggested that uh, all countries which are undergoing a period of transition from uh, an underdeveloped status to becoming a developed state might undergo a few uh, sorts of crises. Now, these crises are, I believe, highly applicable and highly relevant in our discussion uh, in the understanding of the nature of the state in the third world. Now, presently, I shall be discussing these very uh, problems that had already been mentioned by Lucien Pai as the problems which any nation state undergoing a period of transition might face in the course of becoming developed. Now, these particular crises, uh, six in number, uh, have been together called the development syndrome. This term was not used by Lucien Pai. I believe the term was coined by J.S. Coleman. But this term is used to refer to the crisis that Lucien Pai identified as afflicting all transitional societies. The first problem that uh, Lucien Pai has identified is identity crisis. More often than not, the third world countries, a majority of them, actually have a problem in identifying the masses of people living in the third world countries have a problem in identifying with their newly formed governments. And there is reason enough because we have to understand that in the third world specifically, uh, the state is formed prior to the formation of the nation. Okay, because uh, long periods of colonial and imperial domination as well as exploitation had ensured that structures of politics and systems of economy which had worked very, very well in the country of the colonial master had simply been replicated on the soil of the countries which were colonized 
uh, or over which imperial domination was imposed. These systems did not, and I repeat, these systems did not actually grow out of a normal process of political and economic evolution that would have taken place in these countries. Now, these foreign systems, both economic and political, which had worked wonders in the uh, countries of uh, the colonial masters or the imperial masters, did not necessarily evoke the same kind of identification or loyalty that might have arose in case these systems had grown normally in these newly independent countries. So the first crisis that Lucien Pai identified was identity crisis and undoubtedly many of the countries in the third world are facing precisely this particular problem. The second crisis as identified by Lucien Pai was the legitimacy crisis. Now legitimacy as we know is having a particular basis to the authority that a particular person enjoys. Now, charisma, personal charisma, may be a basis of legitimacy. Uh, laws uh, or regulations as written down or codified in a particular country may be a basis of legitimacy. Or tradition may be a very big source of legitimacy. Now, what we find in most of these third world countries, once again, is that historically speaking, the local elites, the landed gentry in some cases, uh, or the half-baked uh, industrial owner or you know manufacturer, or uh, simply speaking, the local bourgeoisie might appear petty, but the local bourgeoisie and even uh, caste hierarchies or uh, language hierarchies all these have been ignored at the expense of establishing a political system which has worked in a Western country. Now, what happened, therefore, was most definitely a very elaborate political system was created. A very definite political structure was put in place. But more often than not, those particular institutions which enjoyed traditional legitimacy as far as the masses of the people were concerned, those particular sections of, uh, uh, you know, seats of legitimate authority still continued to exist. Perhaps a very good case in point would be uh, the fact that um, across northern India, northwestern India, the panchayats, who have been uh, entrusted with just about 29 functions by the Constitution of India, end up issuing diktats relating to uh, who a girl can marry or uh, who a boy can marry, or what should be done with a boy and a girl who marry outside their caste or above their caste or beneath it, and vice versa. Uh, right from the dress code of women to uh, the need for vaccination, everything seems to be depending upon the diktat of the panchayat, which enjoys more legitimacy to the local people living in the villages, rather than what uh, a very... Um, proactive government uh, through using all the possible media uh, available at its disposal would like to convince the nation to do, right? So legitimacy is the second crisis that governments often face in the third world. The third uh, crisis, uh, as, as uh, Lucien Pai pointed out, would be the penetration crisis. Now, as far as penetration crisis and distribution crisis are concerned, we can almost discuss them together. Um, it is not that the third world countries, the governments in the third world countries, are not generating services or goods or commodities for the benefit of the people. Definitely, some of the governments in some of the third world countries are capable of providing uh, welfare services and performing welfare functions. But to what extent do these functions, services, programs, plans, projects actually penetrate into the entire uh, population of the country? Here, we definitely are not talking about metropolitan cities. We are talking about those remote areas in large countries uh, which are still quite inaccessible or even if they are accessible, they are still quite remote.
right? How far do the uh, various plans and programs uh, and projects launched by the government actually reach the people living in the remotest of areas? Are the people in all these areas able to take uh, benefit or advantage out of the various efforts that are being made by the governments of the third world countries? If yes, very good, it does not lead to a crisis. But if not, then definitely uh, it sort of shakes or, uh, you know, shatters uh, the base of popular consent uh, that is at the very base of democratic government. And it is democracy which is established in most of the third world countries today. The next crisis which Lucien Pai uh, has discussed is the participation crisis. Now, obviously, when I'm talking about democratic forms of government being run in the third world countries or most of the third world countries, we are definitely talking about popular participation because uh, democracy without participation is uh, absolutely not possible or practically speaking not possible, right? But what Lucien Pai wanted to highlight over here is the participation of particular sections of the society. Now, uh, it might have been uh, his reference to a gender group, as in the women, uh, of countries which had traditionally been quite oppressive to uh, the female gender. It might also refer to certain caste categories or tribal status categories or, uh, you know, any other uh, category that is prevalent in any of these states. Now, particular sections which have been identified or highlighted as uh, sensitive parts of the population who perhaps need a little more understanding and a little more sensitive handling by the government, uh, Pai wants us to ensure that all those sections are definitely participating in the political process of a country. Because unless they are participating or all sections or other major sections of the population are participating in a democracy, it does not become a true democracy at all. And also, in the process of ensuring that uh, all possible sections of society, spe especially those who are uh, either numerically or linguistically or anyway culturally or gender-wise a minority or in a disadvantaged position, if their participation in the democratic process is not ensured, then we have to doubt the competence of the political structure of those particular countries in any case. The last crisis that uh, Pai talks about or discusses is the integration crisis. Now, uh, here, by integration, he means uh, keeping the unity, the geographical contiguity of the country intact or of the state intact. If there are parts of the country, geographical units of the country, which are not exactly keen on staying with the uh, mainland of the country, then therefore there is bound to be political instability, there is bound to be violence, there is bound to be bloodshed, civil war. All of these factors could combine together to threaten the existence, the continued existence of the nation state in any case whatsoever. Now, these problems have been uh, identified or these crises have been identified by Lucien Pai, not just in the context of the third world countries. He says that these crises might arise in any country which is undergoing a period of transition uh, or which has undertaken the journey towards development. But I find these crises, this bunch of problems highlighted by him, to be highly relevant to us because at the end of this discussion, uh, we will perhaps be able to agree that yes, most of these crises that Lucien Pai has discussed are being faced in the third world countries or some of them are existing in most of the third world countries across the globe today. Now, in the next section, I would just make a, a brief reference to a particular concept enunciated by uh, Samuel P. Huntington, once again, a very major renowned scholar uh, regarding theories of development. Now, what Huntington finds interesting is that uh, there might arise a particular occasion in a newly independent country or a third world country wherein instead of moving forward along the path of development, a country seems to be going backward. 
okay he calls this process as political decay he says that maybe due to lack of political infrastructure or maybe lack of autonomy of the state or maybe an uh, overdeveloped state you know as in a state which is run entirely uh, by the bureaucracy according to its own traditions of you know laws and uh, red tapeism etc a uh, uh, too much of novo developed state or maybe uh, just economic instability and most importantly the lack of proper uh, leadership a leadership which has a will to change the course of the progression of that particular nation state and a leadership with a vision and a capacity to bring about political stability and economic sustenance into its own country under its own grasp uh, a lack of that particular kind of a leadership might actually lead to a situation of political decay we have seen political decay hamper the existence of many third world countries there are countries which have been termed as fragile that is they are almost on the verge of existing to be uh, uh, you know states now uh, samuel uh, p huntington talks about uh, two leaders he talks about nasser of egypt and jawaharlal nehru of india as possessing both the will and the capacity to revert the process of political decay into a process of political development in their respective countries right this approach of huntington has been known as the will and capacity approach and most definitely we will agree that this approach alone can perhaps save many of the states in the third world from collapsing or from uh, you know going back into ignominy and maintaining their existence